An Emmy-winning graphic designer decides to become an artist. Which wins? Passion or income? If you're an artist making money, who handles the paperwork? When cake making becomes an art form. Not only is it a beautiful cake to look at, but it's an awesome cake to eat. Mm, very, very good. Art in Giving, a gallery that sells art but gives 50% to charity. The business of art. This is the language of business. Sponsored by Swapons, the swappable smartphone case company. Make your smartphone your smartphone. Swapons.com. Here's Greg Stoller. There are many reasons to commission a painting. Here's an artist who can give you two for the price of one. Welcome to Elian Markov, the founder of Art and Giving to the Language of Business. Thank you. It's good to be here. Nice to have you here. How Thank does you. Art and Giving work? So Art and Giving is a gallery that is a non-profit gallery. So if you're an artist and you're represented by a gallery, and if, you, if they sell a piece of your art, usually you keep 50%, the gallery keeps 50%. In our case, the artist still keeps the 50%, but the other 50% is directly allocated to pediatric cancer research. Uh, to a 501c3 public foundation. And unfortunately, there's a personal reason why it's benefiting pediatric cancer. All this started with the Rachel Molly Markov Foundation, which is in memory of my daughter who died of cancer when she was nine years old. So this is in her memory, but the mission of the gallery is to raise money for pediatric cancer research to help other families, other children, but also to promote the arts. And we've been very lucky to partner with some companies, some real estate companies, life science companies, uh, companies in the financial sector who have new buildings, new offices, and they partner with us. They usually buy the art or they lease the art. So we have companies like Alexander Real Estate, Biomed Realty, Sanofi Genzyme, uh, Pfizer, uh, Novartis, all these companies give money to the foundation, buy the art, rent the art, and they use their business expenses, not their philanthropic expenses. So it's a win-win in a sense that we augment the amount of money available for pediatric cancer research. Where does the money go? As we know, the NIH doesn't fund too much seed funding. So the money we raised uh, was anywhere from 50000 to 200000 in the past couple of years per year. We give money to seed funding. So we reach out to researchers who are doing very innovative work. Researchers who cannot get any money from the NIH, but have very promising ideas. So one of our biggest successes was we funded uh, a researcher at the Stanford Medical School who was able to use the money that we gave him to prove a concept. And that concept allowed him to gain a multi-million dollar grant from the NIH to continue. So our hope is all that research is going to advance um, finding cures for children and their families. And how do you find your artists? Okay, so the artists, at the very beginning, I used to belong to the Sower Guild in Boston. So when I had a studio, I was written up in the local paper at one point, and artists came to me and said, Elian, I love the idea of what you're doing, fundraising. I'd love to donate a painting next time you do a fundraiser. So many artists said that to me, I said, wait a second, I'm not really looking for art. I have plenty of mine that I can't sell. <laughs> so why don't we try to approach companies and see if they would consider using the art either for gifts to their employees, their executives, their board members, or just to decorate their offices. So we started with about seven artists back in 2009. We now have close to 55, 56, and it's a word of mouth. I used to take anyone who was interested in joining the Gallery of Art and Giving. Now we have a couple of curators who help me identify who should be on the gallery, who should not, uh, what resonates with our clients, what doesn't resonate. So we have, uh, we have a process. What do you see as your biggest challenges over the next four to eight months? <sighs> biggest challenges is really attracting another two or three big clients. So we would love to have more clients like Alexandria, Biomed, Raymond James, uh, you know, Sanofi Genzyme, Novartis, we'd love to have some of these clients. So the biggest challenge is not just to attract them because everyone likes the model, is really to try to get them to engage with art and giving, either buying art or understand the whole idea that we run as a gallery. We're not on Newberry Street, we're not in New York, we're not in California, we're not in Santa Fe, 
but we're online and we have physical space in Cambridge donated to us by Biomed to exhibit some of the art. Equity Office gave us space for a whole year at 100 Summer Street to exhibit the work of many of our artists. So it's been amazing. Uh, Equity Office, for example, um, allowed us to expand and go beyond the Boston area. Uh, they had three lobbies they were decorating in the Chicago area. So they put us in contact and we were able to adorn three lobbies remotely uh, with artists that we happen to have in Chicago. Elian, thank you. It's my pleasure. Elian Markov, founder of Art and Giving. Coming up on the business of art, if you're the artist, who handles the paperwork? When cake making becomes an art form. Not only is it a beautiful cake to look at, but it's an awesome cake to eat. Mm. Very, very good. But first, an Emmy Award winning graphic designer decides to become an artist. Which wins, passion or income? When the language of business look at the business of art continues. You're watching the language of business look at the business of art. Once again, Craig Stuller. What's the difference between a career transition, redirection, or something else? And when can that occur? Welcome to Joanne Calianzas to the language of business. Thank you. What do we refer to you as? Graphic designer, artist, or both? It could be uh, either one or both, depending on, uh, depending on the day. And which usually wins out, passion or income? Uh, well, <laughs> this week it's income. <laughs> <laughs> Much of my time is, is spent as a graphic designer, but uh, I do spend quite a bit of my time as an artist doing my own types of projects that I would say is very much informed by my graphic design and my love for graphic design. Tell us about the Emmys you've won. Okay, well, when I was at Channel 7 in Boston, I was in charge of doing a lot of the design and promotion work for the on-air graphics. And that work, the collection of that work, was what I won an Emmy for. And then uh, years later, in the early 90s, when uh, working on a uh, station in Day Dayton, Ohio, the design work that I did for their news programming was awarded an Emmy for, for the uh, Dayton, Ohio area. You started off as a graphic designer. You've worked for television stations. Yes. When did the artistic flair kick in? The artistic flair was always there. But I would have to say at some point, probably in the late 90s, I kind of, as I have said to others, came to a paradigm shift that I couldn't shift with. And so that sort of was when I stepped out of the television uh, business and moved into the artist community in the Fort Point neighborhood of Boston. And being surrounded by artists was, I think, influential for me, sort of diving headfirst into my artwork. Did it matter to you that it was coming mid-career? No, I mean, we always hear about people having sort of uh, midlife crises <laughs> and, you know, maybe mine came a little bit earlier than my midlife, but, <laughs> but that's okay. I think, um, I think what, what it did was it, w it was a reset. Pursuing artwork allowed me to think differently about my graphic design work to design work that I really enjoyed and loved to do and clients that I really enjoyed working with. And are those clients coming to you or are you on the search for them? Much of my work does come to me by word of mouth and I always feel if I do a good job for somebody, they'll gladly refer me to the next person and I feel that I do my best work via referral. And depending on the type of work you're doing, do the referrals change? Yes, they do. One experience that's happened over the past uh, couple of years is, as I said, I was in television, fell out of sort of that circle and about two years ago, I got a call about a documentary film, and did I know anybody who could do some, some graphic design work for that? And of course I said, well, you know, tell me what you need, and then I'll make some calls for you. But then I looked at their list and I'm like, I can do this. And I found out that I liked it again, and through the connections made on that film, I've worked on five and six other types of projects in the, in the film and television realm again, which is fun. But if you keep jumping in and jumping out, how do you keep current on latest technology trends? You have to be diligent. You have to be a reader. You have to be an uh, investigator. Um, I certainly keep, keep on top of the technology. I mean, you can't get behind with that stuff because all of a sudden somebody says, well, you know, that, that format is obsolete and you got to do it a different way. 
But then also, too, I, I keep my mind current with respect to design and, and other things by going to conferences. Um, and, I, and I do that just to reboot or reset. And, it, and it's something that I enjoy. Do your clients pay you on an hourly rate or on a project basis or perhaps even a retainer? Well, the way I like to do work is I like to look at a project, the whole, the whole scope of a project and determine a price based on what I, what I think it should cost. And when I discuss projects in, in a full dollar figure, then there's rarely any surprises to a client at, at the end of the project. And if you know, something changes down the line, some criteria or some, something that neither of us anticipated, sure, we can renegotiate. Joanne, thank you. You're very welcome. Joanne Kalyanzis, graphic designer or artist, depending on the day. Coming up, when cake making becomes an art form. Not only is it a beautiful cake to look at, but it's an awesome cake to eat. Mm, very, very good. But first, the business of art. If you're the artist, who handles the paperwork? As the language of business look at the business of art continues. If you're an artist and you just got your first big contract, what do you do about the paperwork? That's where Jim Grace comes in. He is the Executive Director of the Arts and Business Council in Greater Boston. Welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you for having me. Welcome. How does the business model work? Well, so we're a nonprofit and we serve uh, artists and arts organizations in Greater Boston and Massachusetts. And our mission really is to help artists with the business of being an artist or a small arts organization. That's what we do. And do you get involved before or after they get their job? We both, actually. So in your example about the contract, so we have one of our programs is called Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, which is about 500 volunteer lawyers, private lawyers in the private sector, who take cases from us and help artists and small arts organizations with with their legal needs. So that's just one of nine programs that we currently have. And what are some of the other programs that you offer? One of our programs is Business on Board. So we train business people to be on boards of arts organizations. Again, strong organizations, strong boards, and vice versa. So it's really the idea that small organizations and artists need business support. They need legal, HR, business support in order to be successful. And so our mission is to help them be successful. And how does your organization make money? Make money. Well, as a nonprofit, we could probably make more. Um, so we have a mix of earned revenue and unearned revenue. So we, we're about a $500,000 organization, and we have uh, you know, fees and services that we provide. But we also have events, and we have grants that we write to foundations and individual contributors. And are all of the lawyers, as an example, strictly donating their time, or do they get any billable hours out of it? Very few. It's probably about 90% all pro bono. Only a small percent for, for artists that don't qualify for our services pro bono um, can get reduced fees from the, art, from the lawyers. But for the most part, it's pretty much all volunteer. And what makes an artist qualify? Uh, based on their income. If they reach a certain below uh, revenue income for their year, they qualify for pro bono services. And same thing with arts organizations. If they're below a, a budget cap, they qualify for pro bono services. And it's about 80% of the artists and arts organizations that apply to us are pro bono. And is this all media of artists? Yes. Yes, it is across disciplines. And many artists are working in multiple disciplines anyway, so that is it's perfectly fine. So is the income based on their income as an artist or total household income? Total household income, yeah. So if they're being an artist on the side, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would qualify for your programs if they have correct. a quote-unquote day job. Correct, correct. But for the most part, again, about 80% of everyone who is applying to us is qualifying for free legal services. And do you tend to find a lot of repeat business? Yes, we've had, I've, I've worked with artists for 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. And arts organizations that have grown from a, a kitchen table startup to now fully functioning, wonderful organizations. So yes, we've, we've seen organizations and artists thrive over many years. You've shared office space in Boston, and who are you sharing with? Yeah, so we created a space at Midway Artist Building, which is in Four Point Channel, and we created a space and invited three other service groups, so Mass Poetry, Mass Creative, and Stage Source, and the Arts and Business Council share space together. And what is your vision for the future of the Arts and Business Council? The vision is to create a platform of services and programs that, are, that can respond to the needs of artists and arts organizations in a very kind of holistic, responsive, thoughtful way. That is, that is our vision for the organization. Now you mentioned you're the Arts and Business Council of Greater Boston. Do you have reciprocity with other organizations across the country? Yeah, so there are volunteer lawyers for the arts programs all across the United States, about 30 programs now in, in most cities in the United States. Arts and Business Council, again, is another program that's replicated around uh, the United States. It's actually a uh, each group is a chapter of the Americans for the Arts, as well as the Arts and Business Council. So there's Arts and Business Councils, Business Committee for the Arts, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, very similar idea. It's how do we get the, how do we get the support of the business community supporting local artists in their communities. How do the requirements of artists change when you move from a local to a regional level? 
there are certain similarities. So legal issues is one. If you're a small organization and you're hiring your first person, you might have HR issues. Um, all, is all organizations have space issues. So we work with them on, um, on all these issues. But the commonality of under-resourced, uh, trying to do good work, not have a lot of internal capacity, boards that need to grow and be developed, those are common issues for, for most artists and most arts organizations. Tell us about your other programs. We have a host of different programs. We have a fiscal sponsorship program, so we've become the fiscal sponsor for groups that are looking to become their nonprofits or don't want to go through that process. We have an HR program that's helping with uh, arts organizations with their HR needs. There are very few HR professionals in nonprofits, and we're helping in that kind of capacity building. Uh, we also have an exhibitions program. Um, we have a program in, in, in Roxbury, which is like a mini MBA program for visual artists, which is a wonderful program. We also have the Walter Feldman program, which is a solo exhibition program for first-time solo exhibitioners uh, in the arts. That, and we give them six months of business skills and, and support leading up to their first exhibition. So it's a wonderful program to help artists kind of get a launch in their careers. Jim, thank you. Jim Grace, Executive Director of the Arts and Business Council of Greater Boston. Next up, when cake making becomes an art form. Not only is it a beautiful cake to look at, but it's an awesome cake to eat. Mm. Very, very good. When the language of business look at the business of art continues. You're watching the language of business look at the business of art. Once again, Craig Stoller. Think it's possible to do something after 30 years and still do it well? Don't ask that question to Paula Corain because she's going to say the proof is in the pastry of sorts. We're on location in Newton, Massachusetts at the Icing on the Cake and welcome to the language of business. Hi Greg, very nice to have you here today. 32 years doing the exact same thing. How do you keep the creativity up? Well, my dad said if you're going to do one thing, do it right. And we've proven that we have successfully done that. And keeping up with the trends is very popular and very important in the wedding industry. You need to know the colors the girls are using, the styles of flowers they're using, and you need to have them feel comfortable that you're the bakery that understands it and knows how to do it well. Are you doing the creative direction or are your clients doing the creative direction? It's a collaboration of both. We have brides come in for a personalized tasting appointment where we hear their ideas, we expand upon what works in the cake industry, and we do sketches in front of them so they can actually see what they're talking about on paper in a sketch and bring it to light. What happens if their eyes are bigger than their wallets? We like to say we have a cake for every budget. So it's a little bit of come up and down. We'll meet you halfway. Um, but we definitely have ideas on ways to help your budget. Maybe do a smaller cake on display and have a backup cake in the kitchen for more servings. That means you're only paying for a show cake and then extra servings, which will always be discounted. After all these years, do you consider yourself an artist or a business person, or maybe both? I wear many hats in the industry. Um, I would say my first hat is a businesswoman. Um, my first love is pastry arts. So it's, it's in my heart and on my head. <laughs> and in terms of your love, is all that profitability created equally? It's hard, it's hard. You know, when you're working in a food industry, it's a tough profit margin, you know. We have a lovely staff of 19 employees and, you know, payroll comes into figures when you're trying to price all this out. So you just gotta come to a happy medium, make everybody happy. But for 32 years, we've been doing it and we've been making a profit. Are there certain cakes that are higher profit margins to you? Definitely. The wedding industry is the most popular industry as far as from a financial and event planning. So you do want to constantly keep your wedding industry high on your format and make that happen as about 85% of your business. But are all weddings throughout the year or is there seasonality that goes There's definitely it? seasons and that what makes the food industry for us tough. January, February, March are our down times. We get to take a little bit more time off, but you got to get right back into it for the busy spring. What about perishability? Can you start a cake three weeks in advance or does it have, always I wish have we to could. be three days in advance? I wish we could start a lot earlier, but because it is a handmade item with wholesome ingredients that, you know, whipping cream, butter, eggs, you have to make it the week of the event. Often our wedding cakes are started two days before the event. All of our work is completed by the end of the week. What happens if somebody comes and picks it up and it's not exactly what they had in mind? Well, we try to, you know, make sure that the order is run through with the client properly so they know what they're expecting. Can't win them all, you know, so you do your best as a business person to win that customer over and say, what can we do to make you happy? Can we redo your cake? Can we adjust something on it? We're in this for happy customers. We want to keep you happy. And how many of your customers are repeat customers? We have a very high percentage. We're up in the 80%. 
The repeating for the quality of the cake, not only is it a beautiful cake to look at, but it's an awesome cake to eat. So it's not all about looks with us. You gotta get to the inside of the cake to taste that fantastic cake. So can you walk us through your product assortment? Wonderful. When brides come in for a tasting consultation, this is what we present. They get to pick their top flavors that they'd like to try. Carrot cake with a cream cheese filling, lemon velvet, which is lemon cake, raspberry, lemon buttercream, the decadent chocolate chocolate mousse, chocolate hazelnut, double chocolate raspberry, golden raspberry. This is just an assortment of the 15 flavors we offer. Are these your best sellers? These or? are. Okay. Not necessarily the ones that have the higher profit margin. No, chocolate's always very decadent. It gives a nice end of a meal. Golden raspberry, lemon velvet for something a little bit lighter, but since the fall, the carrot cake is a nice harvest fall feel. So which would you recommend we start with? I think you should start with the golden raspberry. All right. mm, very, very good. And I think you should also try a little bit of our buttercream. We're known for our buttercream since we based the name of the company on it. Excellent. Very, very good. Thank you. And this you said, is the decadent, decadent chocolate mousse? Yes, yeah, so you want to dig into some of that chocolate mousse filling as well, Greg. Excellent. And what do we have over here? We do an assortment of cupcakes, and we have cupcakes on sale every Friday and Saturday. Uh, most of our other product is based by order only. But if you're hankering for a cupcake, the people from the gym come over after workout and buy a cupcake. And our very cool language of business cake? Yes, we do a lot of corporate work, and logos are a specialty. And what company doesn't like to see their logo in buttercream? Absolutely. Paula, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Paula Corain with the icing on the cake on location here in Newton, Massachusetts. Thanks for watching The Language of Business, a weekly look at ways to encourage and inspire entrepreneurs. Sponsored by Swapons, the swappable smartphone case company. Make your smartphone your smartphone. Swapons.com. To join the conversation or to watch anytime, go to languageofbusiness.biz.